Good afternoon, everyone. This is Sadia Zafar from HRAI. I would like to welcome you to today's session on how smart pumps benefit hydronic systems. This is brought to you by HRAI's member Armstrong Fluid Technology. We have Neil Martin and Peter Wolf of Armstrong Fluid Technology, who will show you how smart pumps make the hydronic systems easier to design, install, operate, making it more efficient and reliable. Um, a little bit of housekeeping, you will notice on the control panel of your screen, the Q&A feature. Please use the Q&A feature to ask your questions at any time during the webinar. They will be addressed at the end of the session. Also note, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be shared with you following the session. We will begin the presentation with Neil, um, um, Neil Martin, sorry about that. Uh, so welcome, Neil. Thank you, Sadia. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Smart uh, Pumping Technology webinar. My name is Neil Martin, and I work for Armstrong Fluid Technology. Just a little bit about Armstrong Fluid Technology. Armstrong is a global leader in providing the building industry with fluid flow, energy transfer, demand-based automation, and fire safety solutions. We are driven to find new and improved ways to resolve challenges, not just uh, to improve on today's technology, but to integrate new design thinking in a way that serves current and future customers. Hmm. Armstrong is an industry leader in delivering next generation intelligent devices that integrate with leading edge technology to positively impact system wide life cycle performance by up to 80%. I'd like to hand it reins over to Peter Wolf, one of our many smart building performance experts here at Armstrong Fluid Technology. Over to you, Peter. Yeah, thanks very much, Neil, and thank you, uh, Sophia, as well. Uh, yeah, uh, so good morning, everybody. Hope you enjoyed this presentation and find it interesting. Uh, the development and introduction of pumps with uh, built-in intelligence uh, make uh, hydronic heating and cooling systems operate more efficiently right from startup and all the way through the system's lifetimes. Design engineers and installers like how they make design, uh, install, and set up easier. Owners appreciate useful operating data they supply, enabling maintenance to be delivered at the right time and not too late, giving them secu the security uh, that their building's environment will always be comfortable. In the next few minutes, you'll hear how smart pumps uh, come about and how they deliver on all these promises. We'll give an overview. Uh, we'll start off in the agenda by giving an overview of intelligent pump technology and, and uh, the mapping that gives them their intelligence. Then we'll discuss how their uh, how this, the, their, their smartness enables uh, the, the spend on controls to be reduced uh, and also reduce your utility bills and your maintenance bills. Indeed. And then we'll, that will then lead into uh, describing how these pumps can uh, produce, can help to have leaner, simpler installation, making that quicker and easier to do at less cost. Then we'll go through the lifetime of, the, of how the smart pump delivers its uh, effectiveness, how it helps balancing, how it makes it sp much sp faster than it uh, normally is, how it can be, how troubleshooting can be, uh, can be made simpler and quicker to do. And then having discussed all about the controls and the setup, but then we look at the product itself and see how new high efficiency motors and, and pump ends are helping to reduce the running cost of your hydronic systems. Uh, then we'll talk about the the ability of, the, of these smart pumps to connect to the cloud and then have data analysis carried out of the work that they're doing and then sent to uh, a web page on, on the yours or the owner's screen and how that helps you sustain the reliability and the efficiency of your whole system right throughout its life. Finally, the last part will be discussing the concept of uh, redundancy of pumps, how many pumps you need as a standby, and the ability that smart pumps have to operate in parallel, which can help to improve efficiency, lower install costs, and produce a, a more efficient uh, system overall. So let's kick off with um, ourselves. So Armstrong, is a, Armstrong has works to provide a 360 degree service and support throughout the, uh, through that product throughout the system lifetime. We'll start with working with consulting engineers at the design and consulting base. We'll then look at uh, working to ensure that we deliver the right product at the right time, and then be there to start up and commission it correctly. Through the life of the product with our online um, data analysis services, we'll deliver performance management, which will help to keep the system running at full uh, best efficiency. And then with our maintenance repairs and parts kits, we'll keep the product up and running through its life. Then 
deep into the life of the product, we'll re-enter and look at performance upgrades and optimization in order to ensure that the system has a full lifespan at peak efficiency. What delivers our, uh, these capabilities is Armstrong's four core competencies. They're heat transfer and fluid flow, um, and uh, our demand-based controls, out of which uh, algorithms were developed for complex water distribution systems and uh, chill water automation and optimization. Added to the digitalization, the ability to connect to the internet and, uh, and the cloud, lifetime care is delivered. The objective of this skill is to have owners and operators around the globe maintaining the building's performance at high level right through their lifetimes. So let's take a step back and understand the difference between a traditional hydronic system installation, and then we'll compare it with a, a smart pump hydronic installation. For a start off, as you can see here, the hydronic one will involve multiple trades. You'll need mechanical to install the pumps. You need the general contractor to go on site and fill, um, fill up, put, put concrete into the inertia bases. You'll need skilled fitters to align the pumps to the pipe work, a wheelwright to align the pump and motor if you're fitting horizontal type pumps. You need the electrical contractor to install the drives. You'll need the controls contractor to find a place to put the pressure sensor, which is going to send the controls, the signal which will control the speed of the pumps in the building and then cable it all the way back. And that's, let's hope that you can find the pressure sensor in five years time and it's actually on the drawing. Um, the pumps themselves will be sized very likely 100% duty, 100% standby. So they'll be as big as possible and designed for the, the design day conditions, which only happen a short number of times. And then you've got the wall mounted VFDs, which needs uh, fitting on site, wiring up and, and the rest of it. Compare that to then smart hydronic system you've got pumps uh, smart efficient pumps which are capable of controlling themselves installed into the pipework uh, connected connected through their wi-fi through a router to the uh, to the cloud to enable you the owner to understand exactly what the pumps are doing and have been doing and what are the, so that you can keep track of the of the the of what your system how your system is operating is it, uh, do you need to control the demand of heating or cooling in your system? The pumps will help tell you that. So all that produces a, a lower cost install, a lower cost um, lifetime operating system and, and reduce startup costs as well. So that's what the smart pump, uh, smart pump uh, system promises. So what is a smart pump you ask? I've been talking about it so much. What is a smart pump? Well, let's start with how it's, uh, how it's put together. Here you see one being assembled uh, on our and put in uh, go through final assembly on our test bed, and it's just going to be put. It's going to be run up and tested. And what we do when we test it is we run the pump at various B each design each of these design envelope branded uh, intelligent smart pumps on our test bed. We run it at various speeds and at various flows and heads, and what we do is create a performance map. An easy to understand picture shows here the power and the speed for each point of head and flow. A point there and a point there, power, speed, head, flow. Overall though, we can we compile a very densely populated spreadsheet here of speeds and flows from zero GPM all the way out to the end of curve, mapping the power absorbed uh, as well. So that if we know the speed and we know the power absorbed, we can tell you what the head is. We can tell you what the head is and also what the flow is. That enables the pump itself on its uh, keypad here to tell you the flow rate, taking the place of a, a flow meter. And flow meters are rarely installed in mechanical rooms for cost reasons and uh, accuracy. You need to have a nice straight line of pipe going in and out in order to make sure to get an accurate reading. So here we have here, a smart flow meter uh, delivered alongside of a standard smart pump. And it's that ability to deliver flow that then helps you to optimize the operation of your system. If you know what the flow is, you can control the staging in and out of your building equipment. You can, uh, you can control your chill water plant better. You can control your, your boiler systems better. You can open up bypass valves, close bypass valves when required in order, to, uh, in order to ensure that your system operates safely. Overall, you can optimize the performance of your system because the GPM or liters a second is, is being delivered directly to you. And uh, Armstrong uses that system, that uh, information in uh, our 
plant controllers, our water-cooled chiller plant controller, our air-cooled chiller plant controller, our cooling tower plant controller, and indeed our multi-pump uh, systems as well. That's uh, for the flow and forms piece out of the uh, sensors, the measurement that we that smart pumps have of the flow rate is so helpful in keeping systems operating at good level. So let's talk about uh, how smart pumps came about and how long they've been in, in development. For us, it started in the late 1990s in Europe with the, with the launch of the uh, uh, frequency converter motor, as it was called then. It covered one to 10 horsepower. It enabled us to develop the mapping and the, and the, the what we call sensorless, the ability to know the flow and know the head and control the pump almost 20 years ago in 2002. It wasn't available in 600 volts though, so it was never brought to North America. That happened 13 years ago with the, oops, that happened 13 years ago with the uh, IVS 102, which was, uh, which was a much larger drive available in all three voltages up to 125 horsepower and then up to, currently up to 1250 horsepower. It's a robust drive. It's, it's worked for 13 years for us. It gives us all the control features we, we require and it's proven itself since uh, 2008. The FCM was replaced in 2017 with the, design, with the permanent magnet, the design envelope permanent magnet, as we call it, in 2017. This, this brought an introduction to a new high efficiency motor, no longer an induction type motor, and I'll go into more details later on that, offering a much higher level of efficiency than conventional NEMA premium motors. And at the bottom end, we have a brand new hydraulic assembly here, which is much more efficient than previous generations. Overall, it's reducing lower running costs. Simultaneously with the introduction of the, the permanent magnet range, we also launched the controller that fits on the front of it, the controller interface, the DEPC, Design Envelope uh, Pump Controller, as you can see here. It's, uh, we, we used uh, I, I, a smartphone uh, as our in inspiration here. With the smartphone, it's, it's full color, it's icon led, it's easy to navigate your way, uh, way through these icons. And it consigns to the past the concept of working with uh, wall mounted uh, frequency converters, which need a two or two or 300 page manual to find your way all through the different parameters. So just like a smartphone as well, it's got a hotspot. There's a Wi-Fi transmitter on these, these uh, controllers, which means that you can connect to the controller on your smartphone or tablet, and then get deeper into what the, the pumps are doing, alter the control settings at a high level, and, uh, and, and really understand, and do, or do everything you want without actually going actually near the pump. And like a smartphone, they're fitted with an accelerometers, just like, so instead of measuring your steps and how far you're walking in a day, this is measuring vibration. So you can get a, a sneak preview as to what's happening to the pump by looking at the vibration. We'll see that in further slides. So that's the what a smart pump is and how it's created and the storyline behind it. Let's talk now and get to, into the, the, the most challenging part of the presentation, which is talking about how it controls flow in, how you can control flow in the system and thereby reduce your utility bills and minimize your spend with the controls company as well. It all starts with the fact that um, heating and air conditioning systems are designed for a design day here at 100%. But the challenge is that most of the time, these systems, uh, it's not always the depth of winter or the, or the height of summer. And most of the time, heating and cooling systems are operating most of the time at part load. So what you have to do is work out a way to have it be most efficient at the time where you're spending most of your time operating, rather than for, for the rare time when you're actually on design day. Now, in the old days, say pre-mid-1990s, uh, air movement systems and water movement systems, hydronic systems, had fans and pumps which worked at constant speed directly connected to the uh, mains power supply and dampers in air movement and control valves in um, three-way control valves in um, in uh, variables in, in old, the old-fashioned system it's this is a modern system where you have a two-way control valve in the old days you had a three-way control valve so that the pump would be working at constant speed all the time and then when the load here, when the coil here didn't, 
when the zone that the coil was serving was at the right temperature, the control valve would just bypass the water around the, around the valve. The pump would be working at constant speed all the time. But with the introduction of variable frequency drives in the early 1990s, uh, controls engineers needed to find a way to um, control the speed of the pump so that when two-way valves shut down, they could slow the pump down to match the reduced flow rate required through the system when these two-way valves closed, uh, closed down to, because the system was at the right temperature. So what we did at the time, and I was around in the 1990s, is that we put a pressure transducer, a differential pressure transducer across the pump and then control the pump to maintain a constant pressure. So we put the pressure transducer right across the pump here, and we'd set the pressure setting of that transducer at the pump nameplate pressure for the, for the job, for the building. So if the engineer said they wanted 100 foot of head, we'd set it for 100 feet. And what would happen then would be that if the, when these two-way valves close, because the building's at the right temperature, and you didn't need to pass water through the, the cooling or the heating coils, um, the pump would slow down as the, as the system flow rate reduced and the speed would drop, oh, but only a little bit. The turn down would be very slight. And what we found is that with transducers mounted on the pump, uh, you're really wasting your money on the, that, that very expensive, as, as was back in the early 90s, uh, frequency inverter, um, because you've got negligible turn down with the transducer mounted across the pump because you're working at constant pressure. So, and with a flat curve, you're not really getting much of a turn down. It was only later that we realized that uh, the way to get good control, best control of your system uh, would be to re relocate that transducer far away from the pump over here at the far end, at the most remote, because then you're just looking to control the pressure to get the same, the right pressure from there to there, just through the coil and through the control valve and the balancing valve. You didn't have to allow for the losses in the riser. So the set point pressure was much lower down here with the result that at part load, you'd get a much bigger turn down in speed all the way down to here. And that big turn down delivered major uh, reductions in power absorbed and running cost. Pump power obeys a cube law. It's not one-to-one. -one. If you drop the speed of the pump by 50%, you're not uh, reducing the power by 50%, you're reducing the power by 87.5%, uh, uh, a half to the power of three, which is one eighth. So that delivers a major reduction in, in power absorbed, but you need to put the transducer at the far end, which then delivers you this system control curve. Now, if that system control curve is important because we'll come back to that later when we talk about smart pumps. So as I said, just to recap, Initially, in the early days, all transducers were mounted there. Now we mount them here. It costs more to mount than remote. You have to lead, you have to make sure it's one continuous cable all the way back down the building to the controls, which costs money. And a lot of people were still tempted to put the transducer in the mechanical room because it's uh, more convenient and easier and cheaper to do, but it just doesn't deliver the energy saving. In order to ensure that uh, the right practice was uh, carried out, ASHRAE, uh, uh, ASHRAE climbed into it and issued its uh, energy legislation 90 point energy standard 90.1 and um, it's the it's compliance with the energy standard is required in many uh, if not all uh, localities and indeed the 90.1 compliance with the 90.1 energy model is required if you want to get your building lead uh, lead certified it, it's prerequisite of uh, being lead certified and insofar as pump systems are concerned, one particular clause relates to hydronic variable flow systems. And the key sentence is down here, which says that at half the design flow at 50%, the power absorbed has got to drop to 30% of the, the, the power absorbed at design. So you, have, you, need, a, you need to demonstrate a 70% reduction in power absorbed in order to, um, at half the design flow, in order to, com to comply with it, and, and then uh, be your prerequisite for if you want to get lead, uh, lead approval. Over the years, ASHRAE 90.1 and its different editions have reduced the size of the, 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 the minimum size of uh, motors on, on pumps from 50 horsepower to in the 2019 edition, it varies upon geography. The lowest is two horsepower. In where I'm sat in Southern Ontario, it's uh, seven and a half horsepower. 
let's just understand what you get if you do put the transducer at the at the right position in terms of power absorbed, which is a proxy for the cost of running the pump. At the design point here, A, it's absorbed, this 40 horsepower pump is absorbing 32 horsepower. At uh, D, at half the flow, after you've commissioned the pump and then um, commissioned the pump, at D, you're down to 14 horsepower, which is a big, decent saving. But if you have a remote transducer at E, you're down to seven horsepower, half of what you got at D. And that demonstrates the uh, power of putting the transducer at the far end of the building. And it's only D that complies with actually 90.1. So you notice again, that control curve, that's arrived by uh, fitting a remote transducer. And also in smart pumps, by programming in a control line here, into the into the uh, that map that you saw earlier with all the duty points and we can control the operation of the pump along that line just like uh, a gps system in a car keeps you on to the on the route you want to take to get from a to b so here we we've got a this control line here is mimicked by this power control line here and here's the senseless map of power and speed with all those numbers and there's the control line here this pump is running at the moment with all the two-way valves open, and this is the system resistance curve, and it's and the pump speed is running at 60 hertz, the control curve, the, pump, the system curve, and the pump curve are all at the same place. What happens if a two-way valve in the system shuts, throttling um, the flow? Well, the curve will get a little bit steeper. So here it's got steeper, and the pumps run up the curve here, and up the curve along the power curve to this point. This is where the GPS type algorithm comes into place. It's saying that at that GPM, you need to be absorbing lower power. You're absorbing too much power. And it then slows the pump down so that it's doing less power and it's back on the curve. So that's how smart pumps uh, self-adjust their speed. And we call that sensorless control because there's no sensor in the system. It's just intelligence uh, uh, controlling the pump speed and knowledge. Now we can change that control curve. We can tweak the numbers by changing the number at zero GPM, higher or lower, and you can move that one higher or lower. They're very simple to adjust on the controller. So that's the control piece. That's the most high concept piece of this, uh, this discussion. I hope uh, I haven't left too many people behind here. Let's move on to, uh, to uh, more mechanical issues, uh, how to make a, a, a simpler, leaner uh, installation that's uh, cost less, easier to install, lasts longer, and is more reliable. Here's what a typical uh, install system has, it looks like, often looks like today, um, very much before handover, I hasten to add. But here you have a housekeeping pad, an inertia base filled with concrete mounted on springs, that will require the pump to be carefully set up to match with the pipework here. There's flexible connectors fitted, um, and then conventional check valves and non-return valves. There's a typical installation which costs. Uh, whereas, and this it's, it's based on this type of uh, schematic design, which uh, engineers often give a detailed drawing of. Let's look at it in more detail here. It's got lots of uh, spool pieces, flanges, elbows, separate valves, check, uh, isolating valve, check valve, strainer, butterfly valve, flexible connector, steel, steel base spring, housekeeping pad, lots to do. Whereas this is Armstrong's um, recommended way of installing. And we have several methods. This is just one of them. As you can see here, it's very simple. It's got our triple duty valve in the outlet, our suction guard in the inlet, and the pump is suspended from the floor slab above, either directly through rods into the steelwork or using uh, uh, pipe hangers, uh, sprung hangers. No connection to the floor at all. And this is a typical example of what one looks like. Uh, the, our, our startup man had just been to the supermarket, I hope you don't mind that. But as you can see, it's a simple installation, there's a flexible connector here, nothing on the floor. Here's another one, a site in Philadelphia. And here's a much bigger one uh, here in a district cooling system in, uh, in Toronto. So it handles small and, and large uh, applications, this simple installation. So that's the install piece. Let's now talk about how smart pumps help with system balancing. So uh, you may ask, what is balancing? 
Well, it's, it's, there's a test and balance person whose job is to tune the control valves and the balancing valves in a hydronic system so that all parts of it, from the bottom of the building to the top of the building, get their fair share of the fluid flow and therefore transfer the right amount of heat or cooling. Uh, having got all the zones in balance, the final step they have to do is make sure that the, that the main pump is delivering the right overall flow rate. Now, with a smart, normally, the engineer will measure flow, uh, but he'll go to a balancing valve on the main header, apply a pressure uh, sensing device, and then read the pressure, and then look at that pressure rating on the chart that the, 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 the valve manufacturer will have published, and then read off the flow rate. Uh, this is a fairly complex process and it needs a main a balancing valve in the main header, uh, which is a large expensive piece of kit. This slide shows how it can be done automatically using your uh, smart pump. You just use the touch screen here, the opening screen, press the pump icon, press the automatic balancing icon here, and then you just press the check button, which asks you, are all the two-way valves open? And if they're not, if you only have half the system available, then you, and you only, if it's an 800 GPM pump, but today there's only going to be 400 GPM of flow, you enter, press the button there and enter the number, and then you press start. And what happens then is that the pump automatically starts itself up and runs up over a couple of minutes to, until it reaches your design flow that you've entered. And then it measures the design head and then automatically overwrites the real head. Did I say design head? It measures the actual head of the system, not what the engineers uh, estimated, the actual one, and then overwrites that number into the pump's controls. So automatically the pump has uh, balanced itself. Now, some engineers are a bit old fashioned and choose to do it themselves. So they'll manual flow balance. Instead, instead of going to the control point here, they'll press the or auto button, which brings up the hand off auto selection, pick hand, go into the hand button, update it, and then they'll see the, the, the speed of the pump and they can adjust the speed of the pump up. And while they're doing it, they're looking at the GPM and the foot of head and they'll adjust the speed up until they get to the right flow. And then they can take a note, write it down and then adjust whatever they have to in their control system. But, but because the pump is measuring the flow, you can easily use uh, these, it's smart to do the job for you. So that's flow balancing. The next on the agenda is troubleshooting. Once again, troubleshooting is something made easier by knowing what the flow is. And the example I've got here is a job I was involved with uh, in Pennsylvania a few years, a couple of years ago. And this was a design and build job by a, by a contractor on a project where they were putting in a boiler heating system in it to replace a district scheme, uh, sorry, district uh, heating, district steam uh, system uh, in downtown uh, Philadelphia. So what we did here was, we, it's, there's the boilers that have been squeezed into this small space available. There's our pumps up here, uh, there. And when we started the pumps up and got the system up and running, we noticed on the keypad here that the pumps are doing 51 gallons a minute, 41 foot of head. And that kind of caused us a bit of concern. We couldn't get anything more out of the pump than 51 gallons a minute. And looking at the settings uh, uh, on, on, our, on the pump, what it should be doing, and we connect up on our Wi-Fi, it should be doing, um, what does it say there, 100 and uh, should be doing 122 gallons a minute. That's the design flow. Well, what, what it turned out was that, going back two pictures, that the, uh, the, the pumps, although they're two and a half inch pumps, they were designed to operate in four inch pipe work, but the fitters, they didn't inadvertently put in 65 milli, two and a half inch pipe work. So the resistance of the system was a lot higher than expected. Uh, once they'd repiped it in four inch, then they got the full flow rate. But they wouldn't have known this problem until they'd actually started to use the building uh, and generate the hot water that was needed. We were able to, to, to find that, to troubleshoot even before they knew they had a problem. Otherwise, if they hadn't had this, they might have not found out until they'd actually uh, handed over to the customer. So that's troubleshooting, how senseless pumps, uh, smart pumps that know their flow can tell you in advance early what's, what's going wrong with your system. Now the next piece, we call it sustained system efficiency. This is the ability of the pumps to connect uh, to uh, the cloud. So we have the, these pumps, have, smart pumps have uh, Wi-Fi transmitters. And what we do is we connect them to a router 
placed in the mechanical room. And then the router is connected to uh, the cloud, to uh, IBM Watson, our data analytics provider. And what IBM Watson will do is take that data and then put it, uh, crunch it, and present a series of uh, desktops, a series of screens, which help, help you to see what's happening to the pump, how it's been working. Let's, uh, let's not listen to me. And what that does is, is that it enables it, analytics as to what it's doing and give you specific insights into what the pump is doing, enabling uh, the pump systems to be, have, be more reliable and better performance. And overall, the uh, website where the pump uh, information appears becomes a complete uh, asset management solution. You can get your O&Ms off the site, you can understand uh, the, um, you can get your operation maintenance manuals, you can see what firmwares are fitted into the pump, you can find out everything that's going on with it. You can order up your, your spare parts if you wish as well. The overall benefits of, of the pump manager, as we call it, is to reduce your operating costs, make the product more uh, reliable, improve the performance of your overall system so that the occupants of the building have a better time and make it more reliable. Here's some screenshots. This is showing the uh, vibration generated by a pump and showing the maximum and minimum limits. This is from a typical example where we did find that there was a motor bearing off uh, on a pump and we didn't need to change the, uh, the motor bearing before it failed. And that's a good thing too. This one here shows the flow profile so what it's telling you here is what percentage is working at 10 to 20 percent or 20 to 30. So this pump's working at this percentage here, and you can filter on the time scale, be it last week, last month, last quarter, last 30 days, or over the whole lifetime. That's the flow profile. The load profile is the flow times ahead. That's the total power. Once again, that's showing you where it's operating. It's not operating at 100 percent. It's operating at a fraction of it. And once again, you can filter by the, the time the time scales to see how it's trended. You can click on click that and that and that, see whether the that bar has moved around. And overall, it'll show you the energy saved by the, by the pump, basically depending on the time of year, month by month by month, year by year. So that's um, that's pump pump manager as we call it, which is a cloud based data. Uh, data management and analytics uh, service, helping to produce a more efficient uh, system and a more reliable, efficient pump operation. So we've talked about controls, we've talked about cloud connection. Now let's talk about the hardware itself, how we're developing more efficient uh, motors and, and pumps. I touched on uh, there are, at the moment we've we've we sorry at the moment four years ago in 2017 we released uh, our range of uh, pumps with permanent magnet motors up to 10 horsepower um, available in vertical inline in the in on the in the center twin head the tango uh, on the left and then the horizontal end suction uh, on the right uh, complete with its spring isolators at the core of it is is the similar technology the permanent magnet motor over here. It uh, takes us forward from the induction motor where uh, a magnetic field created by the stator coil on the outside of the motor induces magnetism in the rotor because it's still high quality steel laminations in the rotor which pick up the magnetism and then become magnetic in their own right and then turn and that takes up energy. With these, neat, with these permanent magnet motors, instead of these steel laminations, permanent magnets are embedded in the rotor and they're already magnetic and they're highly magnetic using uh, rare earth uh, magnets. So that all the rotor, the stator has to do is just turn the rotor and that makes them more efficient. In fact, their range is NEMA Ultra Premium and in Europe that would be described as IE5. The difference being anywhere from over 10% um, improvement in efficiency, or 10, 10 percentage points better, 11.7 percentage points better at one horsepower, down to 2.6, so almost 3% at the higher horsepowers. And that's, and given the higher horsepowers, it's still a highly significant uh, extra benefit to the owner. That's the efficiency at full load. One of the other benefits of permanent magnet motors is that their efficiency gets better at part load. So as you slow the pump down, the efficiency doesn't decay with the permanent magnet like it does with a uh, induction motor. So you get even better efficiencies at part load. So that's the motor side of it. 
uh, and the, the permanent magnet motors and those high efficiency motors are being going to be made available in larger horsepowers and that's something that uh, Armstrong's uh, developing now for release in the next uh, next 12 to 24 months. So at the hydraulic end, we, we also on the new products have improved our efficiencies tremendously. What use for a typical duty here of 300 gallons per minute at 50 feet, where before we'd be in the 60s, needing a seven and a half horsepower motor. Now we're, at, we're in the 80s, needing only a five horsepower motor, leading to 20% operation sa operational savings and also a reduction in cost because it's a, a smaller, it's a smaller powered, a smaller motor pump. And if you look at the whole one to 10 horsepower range, or fractional up to 10 horsepower range, we've compared them with our a major competitor of ours. And all the green slots here show where our motors, our pumps have a smaller motor than the competitors do arising from the higher efficiency. And in fact, some sizes at this end here with the little icon here are two sizes of motor down. And there's a few odd balls which are, uh, which are larger, but overall you can see they're better, sometimes a lot better, especially at the smaller end. So that covers the hardware side of it. Now let's go back to what uh, I showed you twin pumps earlier on. I think we need to spend some time to talk about how running pumps in parallel, twin pumps or single pumps uh, ganged up together uh, can deliver more efficient operation and, a, and reduced install cost. And that's uh, which enabled by the software. Smart pumps like, to, like our smart pumps can talk to each other. And we just, uh, once they're connected up using a CAN bus cable, they stage themselves in and out and they can adjust their speed to, uh, to meet the varying demands of the heating and cooling system. With that capability, we can then have a conversation about the size of the pumps. Do they always now need to be sized for 100% of the duty? Maybe not. Maybe they can be sized for less than 100%, but yet be capable of delivering uh, design when working in parallel. So what we need to do is just define, uh, uh, understand redundancy. Uh, what we're gonna, In the next couple of slides, for us redundancy, it means the flow rate with one of the pumps out of action over the design flow. So if you have a 100 gallons a minute design and with a pump out of action, you've got 70 GPM, you've got 70% redundancy. The other term we're going to be using is capacity split, which is what percentage we're going to apply to your design flow and apply to each pump. In this curve here, we've got uh, two pumps at, here's 100%, we've got two pumps each sized at 50%. There's one pump curve, that's the two pump curve. What would happen if one of the pumps drops out of action? Well, that one pump would run down the curve until it intersected the system curve down here. And indeed the pump itself normally will have some extra uh, speed available. So it'll run itself back up to maximize its speed, generally delivering about 70% of, um, of design, uh, I, giving us what we call 70% redundancy. So a 50% pump is not necessarily giving you 50% redundancy, it's giving you near 70%. So let's, if we look at these different capacity splits, 50%, just to understand the numbers, 50%, if it's 300 gallons a minute, 50% is 150, 100%, which is standard duty standby, that's 300. 70% would say be three times seven is a 221, 210 gallons a minute. So that's an a, a, a explanation of what capacity split means. And all of these features are available in our Adept Select software on our website. So how does that apply? So how does that apply? What happens with the, uh, the cooling capacity of a cooling coil? If you don't have full uh, flow through the cooling coil, how is the heat or cooling output affected by it? So here's percentage of full flow. There's uh, your totally emitted power by it. What happens, say, at on a cooling application? Uh, there's the curve describing, there's, a, there's the performance curve of a cooling coil. As you can see, it delivers 100% at 100% of flow, but the rate of drop-off is quite slow. It only really starts to tail off when you get down to below halfway. So at 80% of flow, generally you'll get about 95% of your cooling, which is, uh, gives you minimal impact to occupant comfort. And on the heating application, 
whether you have a different delta T at 80% of the flow, you get 98%. So overall, your impact, your impact is not going to be that much if you're not getting a full 100%. And the occupants of the building or the space won't be in uh, any trouble. The other thing to look at with um, parallel operation is that instead of having one pump uh, with its efficiency curve here being most efficient at that point, if you have two pumps each helping each other out, you'll be more efficient down to the lower percentage of flow. And in many applications where you'll have extended periods where you're operating at what some people call a micro load, you'll get more efficient operation if you have two pumps sharing the load as opposed to one big pump doing it. So that's the benefits of operating multiple pumps in parallel. What we also need to talk about is how you control those pumps in parallel. Conventionally, uh, multiple pumps, and these are efficiency curves, are staged in and out based on their speed. If one pump runs up to its maximum speed, a conventional control system will then stage in the next. If, the, if that pump is the duty produces such that that pump slows down, when it reaches its minimum speed, it'll stage itself out. Uh, with, uh, with, with the smart pumps, with Armstrong smart sensors pumps, the uh, design envelope branded pumps, we stage them in and out based on their efficiency, not on their speed. So if that's the efficiency, we'll stage them at these points here because it's more efficient to run three than two, two than three. Let's see, let's track from here right the way through to see how they compare. So as the two-way valves in the system open up and the system runs up its curve, Everything's the same until this point here. If we move forward, the second pump is cut in on the best efficiency staging, but we're still persevering with the one pump here to um, until we get to maximum speed. This power absorbed here is less than power absorbed here. Let's carry on. Now we're staging the second pump. We're already at this point here. Best efficiency staging will stage in the third pump, whereas Conventional speed-based staging will persevere with just two. So all three pumps running here, just two pumps here, and now we get a major difference in power absorbed. So parallel sensorless pump control offers, with best efficiency staging, can offer, the, offers the ability to connect, size up, select smaller pumps, keep them operating at them at their, uh, their maximum efficiency, optimum efficiency, right the way through from micro loads all the way to, to uh, full load compared to a conventional duty standby pump. And best efficiency staging is available as standard on our dual pumps and our twin pumps. We factory connect them together. We make the dual arm, which is uh, available in for up to 125 horsepower. It's got isolating valves fitted, so you can isolate one pump from the other. And it's uh, like if all the smart pumps, you can connect it to um, a pump manager or uh, a data analytics supplier. And then Tango, which is the, which is the permanent magnet, one to 10 horsepower product. Once again, you can select it choosing your redundancy. It's got best efficiency staging. It's got the ultra premium efficient motor, high efficiency hydraulics at the bottom end, allowing, and then the connectivity through a pump manager to uh, di data diagnostics for active performance management. And what that delivers is a huge saving. If you're moving from say two conventional uh, 20 horsepower pumps duty and standby to two 10 horsepower pumps operating duty support, major reductions in weight of the installation, um, footprint is much, much smaller, and the overall cost reduction is huge, 65% it says here. So if you're, if you're challenged on budget, uh, using twin pumps or dual pumps is, is, a, is a great solution. So in addition to the one to 10 horsepower range, we uh, Armstrong make larger products, the dual arm up to 125 horsepower, vertical inlines integrated with the speed controller up to 450 horsepower, and then with wall mounted drive up to 1250, horizontal end suction up to 125 horsepower. They're not like a conventional base plate mounted pump. They're a horizontal version of our vertical pump with a rigid coupling. So there's no alignment required at all. 
And then of course our suction guide, which enables for a compact installation and with this with a strainer capability and our triple duty valve which can be mount supplied straight through like this or rebolted together to form a short radius elbow and not forgetting of course that the for residential and like commercial applications uh, our other smart pumps with our design and envelope brand the compass r for heating and for cooling applications and the compass h they both uh, have um, uh, ECM, high efficiency motors, electronically commutated motors. They both have the capability of self-adjusting the variable speed. Uh, both models also have the auto setting, which is an intriguing, uh, which is the default setting. That's intriguing because what auto setting does is it's got machine learning built into it so that if there are long-term changes to the heating system, such as you stick uh, an extra couple of radiators or, or baseboard heaters into the system, the pump will learn that this, the system's got bigger and change its settings automatically and to provide the right flow through that baseboard system. Quite remarkable capability. So, everybody I've, I've reached very much the end of, of this presentation i hope you enjoyed it um we've talked about how smart pumps uh, knowing the flow in head deliver effectiveness and efficiency and reliability um, they're easier to install they cost less to install and the installation overall is simpler we've talked to you through about how permanent mag motors reduce uh, operating costs and uh, and the like and and also i didn't mention their sound levels they're remarkably quiet remarkably quiet Parallel pump control, I've explained that in depth, how it reduces, how by using multiple pumps can reduce capital and costs and uh, operating cost. And then we've run through uh, Tango and Dual Arms, our twin pumps, and Describe Pump Manager. So I, I welcome any questions you may have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, one question is, um, my customer likes bypasses on their vfd can you mm -hmm. do a smart pump with a bypass no <laughs> we don't do bypasses uh, i've been involved with vfds for a long long time and they were definitely a must-have back in the 1990s drives were very expensive and were reliable to trip at any moment in time uh, fast forward 30 years now and um, bypass drives are hugely smaller more affordable and more reliable as well so that um, now that we put them onto we, and they're small enough to fit integrate onto pumps like we do if you want uh, redundancy then you got your standby pump with its integrated drive and that puts um, bypasses as uh, not required the, i don't see them being required if, on a fan application where you don't have a standby fan and that would, but then you're going to get, get another problem because with the introduction of permanent magnet motors, permanent magnet motors cannot work directly off the mains. They can only work off a of VFD. So that's it for bypasses. Good question, though. Okay, aren't VFD mounted to pumps going to be shaken to pieces? Uh, I hope not. <laughs> well, they <laughs> haven't for us. <laughs> they haven't for us. We've been running, as I say, pumps for integrated drive pumps since 1998 and uh, the 102 range for the last 13 years and uh, vibration isn't an issue um, the drives themselves are hugely robust uh, they're made of uh, cast aluminum aluminium um, with a big heat sink at the back so they're, they're rock solid no it isn't a, it's not an issue and we've okay. proved over since 2008 good to know um so if if a building owner demands a common vfd policy on their estates how would one deal with that? Uh, that can be a challenging one, um, with uh, because I can understand the need to do it. Uh, the, the problem for, for building owners is that VFDs, wall-mounted VFDs, uh, if you've got three or four different brands in them, nobody knows all the parameters and it knows all the way through the 200 page manual for each VFD to understand how to um, navigate their way through the, the, the through the, um, uh, through all the parameters and all the protocols on it. So that's number one. They, people won't be familiar with it, won't know, uh, understand every single one. And uh, so with that's the reason why with, with uh, the, the controller that you saw, we, it's a simple icon led, it's dedicated to pumps. It's not trying to do all sorts of other things. It's dedicated to pumps. You press the icon, which is pretty intuitive, and you find your way around the, uh, the operation very simply. So it's, it's a simplicity means that you no longer have to treat them like a highly complex 
uh, piece of equipment that you need to go to university on before you can operate on it. Okay, last question. How would yeah. I, how do I specify your product without making you exclusive? Well, I wish, I'd like to say that we were exclusive. Um, we certainly have been the leaders in the development of this uh, of this this technology uh, lots of other people are work are very not far behind us so the, uh, if you if you uh, if you can't specify precisely then you just just specify that the product or the installation as a whole has the capabilities that we're talking that we're that we claim it doesn't have to be built into the pump it could be supplied loose as a separate item uh, some of these capabilities so it's it, it's easy to write a specification which says have this that this sort of pump and then also if not you don't have that then have other uh, products that then complement it and d deliver the full package that uh, our smart pumps do okay great thank you peter uh, this mm -hmm. ends our presentation for today i hope our members found this informative if you have any questions please feel free to reach out to HRAI. Additionally, please complete the evaluation survey that will appear on your screen at the end of the webinar. And with that, have a great afternoon, everyone. And thanks again, Peter. Thanks, Sophia. Pleasure meeting you. And uh, thanks, Neil. Same here. Take care. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.